Hello everyone and welcome. My name is John Sterrett. I am the founder of Procure SQL and in this session you are going to learn how to build your very first hybrid lab utilizing Azure. So what does this mean? This means that we'll go over how you can set up a very basic home lab and then extend it over to an Azure virtual network so you can utilize resources in both your local area network and also your Azure network as well. Before we dive in, I want to make sure that you're able to explore everything that PASS has to offer for you inside and outside of this wonderful conference. I've been a member for about a decade and I would never ever be anywhere where I was technically or even networking wise in my career without leveraging these opportunities. Go check and see if there's a local user group around that you can join here. Also, make sure that you take advantage of all the virtual groups as well. Same thing with the past marathons. If you get a chance, please make sure you volunteer. I will share my success through PASS has been mainly through networking, through various opportunities I've had in my career to actually volunteer. Whether it was actually founding and running the High Availability and Disaster Recovery Virtual Chapter, or even running local user groups like the Austin SQL User Group, or other user groups. Same thing with speaking and attending SQL Saturdays as well. The thing I love the most about PASS is there are so many different opportunities for you to connect, share, and learn. Please, when you're done with my session, if you could do one thing to help me out, please go ahead and do the valuation. If you love the session, that's great and awesome. But if there's anything you didn't like, I please ask you to leave me some feedback so I can continue to grow and make sure that I deliver better content for you as the viewer. So once again, I'm John Sterrett. I'm the founder of a small consulting company in the US here called Procure SQL. We focus on making your data fast, secure, and highly available whether it's in the cloud or in a local data center. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. I'm a Microsoft certified solution expert in a data platform as well. And also was formerly a Microsoft MVP for data platform too. Today, in this session, we are gonna cover the following core things that are needed for you to go from zero to what I would call a hybrid lab that allows you to have a local network that can actually establish connectivity back and forth from an Azure virtual network that would allow you to test things in a hybrid scenario. For example, in this presentation, we're going to focus on a very minimal availability group and being able to fail that over across both networks. So in order to do this here, we are actually going to go over the process of configuring not only an Azure virtual network, but how to set up the gateway so it can connect to your local network. We're also going to talk a bit about your home lab setup, and we're going to talk about key things to make the network connection as fast as possible. We're going to talk about real quickly the cable modem, setting up your router, and being able to also leverage a service inside of Microsoft Virtual Machines remote access server to allow you to remotely route network traffic from your local network over to your Azure Virtual Network and establish that VPN connectivity that you're gonna need. Once we have that in place, we're gonna quickly go over how you can extend Active Directory into a virtual machine out in your virtual network out in the Azure, and then actually build the Windows failover cluster and the availability group. So that way we can use our wonderful knowledge about SQL Server 
to test our hybrid lab that we create in today's session. First, we're going to dive into the architecture overview. This is the thousand foot level of how all the pieces out in Azure and your local network are going to communicate together to allow you to have a hybrid lab. So this, if pit, little up. three, two, one. If pictures were worth a thousand words, this one might be worth a million. This is actually showing you piece by piece of how our lab locally and in Azure are going to communicate with each other. So the first thing you have is the wonderful internet cloud, right? that's going to come through your cable modem, right? Assuming that you have a cable modem and that's how you're connecting to your internet. That will directly connect to a router. Now the router might be built inside of your cable modem, depending on if you're using one that you got from your ISP um, or not. Now, one tip I will give you is a lot of those ISP combo modem routers have a lot of limitations that allow you to not be able to configure things to your liking, which is why in my scenario here, I have them separate and I'll showcase why when we go into things like routing or if we go towards port forwarding, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But you have three main things in your home network. You're gonna have a modem to connect to the internet that's gonna go to a router that then will go into computers. So in this case here, I just have one Mac mini that I'm leveraging as my Hyper-V server, which will have my VMs in it. Now, the key thing here for network connectivity is the remote routing access server. This is the service that is gonna allow us to act as our gateway endpoint to go through the VPN tunnel here to connect over through to the Azure Virtual Network through its network gateway. Now this network gateway then will act as in our communication from Azure that allows us to flow data from our Azure Virtual Network over to our local network here. So in order to set this up, you obviously have to have an Azure subscription Inside of that subscription here, we'll create a virtual network, which is our main network here that you would see as VNet1. Inside of this network, we'll have two different subnets. One is for the gateway, which is required in order to establish that gateway point connectivity out over to our local network. The other subnet will be where we would actually have our virtual machines. So in the case of simplifying our hybrid lab here. We're just going to have a local Active Directory DNS or VM there, and also what I call Azure SQL 01 VM, which is the SQL Server template for a VM out in Azure as well. The following is the nuts and bolts easiest, simplest way to validate what I would call a hybrid lab scenario. And this is looking at the SQL Server Availability Group and Windows Failover Cluster. We would have a cluster here that's going to span both our local network and our Azure Virtual Network here. When we go through and create the Availability Group Listener, you'll see here that we're going to end up having an IP for each domain here. right? So 192.168.44 will be our local domain. Now on your router, by default, almost all routers will start with 192.168.0 class C subnet. I always like to change that because you can't route networks if they have the same IP address subnet. So I always like to change that and make that difference. So in this case, I decided .44. Now on Azure VNet, we have the same thing over there with 10.44.0 as well. So at the core here, we're gonna have a Windows failover cluster with three nodes that will host an availability group with three replicas. 
And there will be one database here that will have all of its traffic sent through the endpoint traffic using port 5022. And then of course for connectivity from any applications like Management Studio, we could connect through our listener, which will be set up to use these IP addresses. Speaking of networking and IP addresses, I wanted to drive a little bit deeper into the network connectivity because establishing a good hybrid lab really requires you to think and plan out the network. The network is super crucial to be able to having both your local network and your Azure virtual network communicate with each other. So as I mentioned, I always like to change the default subnet there to something different than 192.168.0. In this case here, I'm gonna use 192.168.44. And you see the dash 24, if, if you're not familiar with subnetting, that's basically just saying, okay, I can have 256 possible IP addresses by changing that last number zero. So the first three numbers, 192.168.44 can't change, but the last one can. Now in Azure, we have a virtual network here that we're setting up and we're actually gonna only lock in the first two numbers being 10 and 44. And the reason why is just in case we wanna have a lot of different subnets, um, we have more room to expand if we want. So we are required if we want to have a gateway connection outside of our virtual network, we have to set up an Azure gateway and that requires the slash 27. So if you're wondering why did John decide to do slash 27, it's just because that's what's required when setting up our gateway to get out and communicate back and forth with our local network. Now the actual subnet that we'll use for our Azure SQL 01 and also our Active Directory in Azure, those VMs will be under the subnet 10.44.0. So just like the local network, we're only gonna be able to use IPs in that last number there for our VMs. Now, some other key things to note is we have a local, what I would call a static IP address from our cable modem, right? If we're gonna go out or something needs to come into our local network, it's gonna to have to start at that local static IP address, which in this case is 24.55.0.112. Now, what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna use routing to set up route traffic through routing and also port forwarding to leverage our remote access server here. And what this is going to do is anything that comes in, we're going to tell it, hey, there's two ports that we need to communicate through a remote routing access server. And our router is going to forward all that traffic through those ports to our local gateway, which is our remote routing access VM in this case, which is 192.168.44.201. So basically think any traffic that comes from Azure that needs to go to our local network, it's first gonna go through our local network IP address. Then our router is gonna actually route that over to our local gateway, which is our remote routing access servers. That then will allow the traffic to go to whatever VM that it needs to go. The other thing we need to know, and this you're not going to know until you create the actual gateway in Azure, which we will, is that you're going to have an IP address that Azure is going to give you. That's going to be your local way to get into Azure, just like 24.55.0.112 is the entryway into the virtual network. Well, in this case, the entryway into the Azure virtual network to talk to the gateway subnet is going to be 104.214.57.16. So every time you would recreate the Azure gateway, 
that IP address is always going to change, even if you never change anything with your local network. All right, so let's dive in a little bit and talk more about the virtual network configuration within the Azure Virtual Network. There's basically four components that are critical for you to allow traffic to come in from the outside of Azure from your home lab and communicate with the Azure Virtual Network. The first one is, well, obviously here, you actually have to have a virtual network. So think of a virtual network as your own place in Azure that is isolated, that is completely on its own, that you have the ability to set up ways to connect inside of it. But anything inside of the Azure Virtual Network can communicate with each other. The Virtual Network Gateway now is a tool that's going to be required to allow you to let traffic inside of your Virtual Network. The Virtual Network Gateway IP, this is going to be the static IP that Azure is going to give you so you can utilize it with other networks to tell it where the traffic should go if it needs to get into your Azure Virtual Network. Last here, we have the local network connection. And this is establishing the connection from that IP address inside of your virtual network gateway to the local IP address of the gateway inside of your local network. So I like to kind of think of this actually as the bottom up. Right? We need to know before we even think about touching Azure Virtual Network for connectivity into it, we need to know what is the gateway IP address of our local network. Then once we have that, we need to have a gateway public static IP address from the virtual network gateway, which will then go through the gateway to get access into our virtual all right, so let's take a look a little deeper here. So we're going to start from the top and go all the way to the bottom here. So the virtual network. This is our safe haven area that's isolated by default that resources inside of this network can communicate with each other, but things cannot communicate to it from the outside and vice versa to be safe. So here we have our 10.44 network here, address space. And inside of here, we're going to see that we actually have three network interfaces that are attached to VMs. And then we have our virtual gateway. So the gateway is set up in its own subnet. So that way it can allow connectivity in and out of this virtual network. So let's go take a look at the gateway. So here's the virtual network gateway. And the first thing that you should notice here, if we look on the right there under virtual network, this is tied to our virtual network we just talked about. Now, we've also set up here the public IP address. So Azure gave this to us as we go through the installation of creating our network gateway that we can then use with other networks to communicate. And that is done in what Azure calls a local connection. And we're going to take a look at that next. So here is your local network connection. The local network connection here, as you can see, ties everything together. In our case, all of our local network traffic goes through that static IP of our cable modem, which is 24.55.0.112. The virtual network gateway here is the public IP of the gateway for the Azure Virtual Network, which is 104.214.57.16. And this is connected to our 10.44 network. The last key component here, and this will take a while after you set up both the virtual network and remote routing access service in your local network, it took me about five minutes or so, but then you should see the status flip over to connected. And that's how you know that you have a solid connection and that you can actually transfer data between both networks.
So let's go ahead and take a look and see how you can go through building out your net virtual network. All right, let's actually go ahead and create our gateway inside of our VNet. Once we have our Azure Virtual Gateway configured, we'll then be able to build the connectivity over to our remote routing access service. All right, so we're gonna say add, and let's say network gateway. All right, we're gonna call this VNet one gateway. We're gonna make this be in South Central US. We're gonna select our VNet network. So this is gonna utilize the gateway subnet create there. And then here we're gonna actually create our public IP address that we're gonna to use to get into our gateway from the outside. So this is gonna be our All right, now that our virtual network gateway is deployed, we can go to that resource. We can see that we now have our public IP network address that we'll end up using in our remote access service. It's connected to our local VNet here. So the next thing we need to add here is our local So now we need to build out our local network gateway. So we need to tell our local network gateway here to use our static IP address. and what network spacing we're going to use. And we're going to go ahead and create our local network gateway. And so now we have to set up our connection here. So we're gonna use our virtual network gateway here, the local network gateway we just created. We just created. Yep, I'm just gonna use PASS 2020 as my shared key. We're gonna use IKEV2 here, and we're gonna go ahead and hit OK to create. And so while this creates the connection here, it's still not gonna be able to connect yet because we haven't allowed access into our local network. So now we're actually gonna go over to our remote 
routing access service and set that up so now that we can set up the other side of the network connection here. So now we're gonna set up the routing and remote access services to be able to connect over to Azure. So to do that here, we're gonna say new network, call this Azure GW. We're gonna connect through local private network, IKE V2. Here we're actually gonna put in our IP address from our gateway in Azure. We're gonna route our packets. We're gonna add our destination here. And this is gonna be our VNet inside of Azure. So it knows to route all traffic over here. Now we have to set up the security. So we're actually going to use that key, pass 2020. We're going to make sure to set this to try three times here. And then here we'll set up, make sure that we have our gateway connected. And then that's how you actually go through and set up the routing and remote access so that way your network can make it over to the Azure virtual network. So now we're gonna take a look at how we can configure our home lab and maybe some things that you should really consider as you build that out. So in my case, here is my home lab. I have a cable modem that is my connection out to the internet. It's directly connected into a Netgear router that allows me to configure dynamic DNS if I want, which is a nice naming way that you can actually use to connect to the internet port forwarding so that way if I have very particular ports for example we're going to require a couple of those here for setting up a remote routing access service I can then port forward those ports so that way any connectivity through those ports go directly to that service and then a real nice thing that I like inside of my router is I'm able to do custom route tables so I can tell my router that any traffic that wants to talk to 10.44 that this needs to go directly to my remote routing access service so that way it can go through the gateway and on out to Azure I don't have to do this per server through command prompt or anything like that it's real nice to have that done at the router level so it globally works for everything inside of that router so now inside of Hyper-V, we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail about SQL because, you know, everyone here knows quite a bit of SQL. We will go through building the availability group. But we're going to talk about Active Directory and how we can easily get a domain controller working and communicating in Azure over to our local network so we have redundancy there. So if for whatever reason our local AD needs to be serviced, we still have an Active Directory domain controller in Azure to utilize. And then of course we'll go over how we can set up routing and remote access services to be able to take our traffic that needs to go to 10.44 and make sure it gets out to Azure as well. So a couple things I do want to talk about is the actual hardware that I've chosen to use and why I use it, just in case it's helpful for anyone that wants to build out their own home lab or change the configuration of their home lab. The most important thing, I think, is your cable modem because you're only going to go as fast as your cable modem. So one thing that you want to make sure you have is at least DOCSIS 3.1. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but 
This is what's going to drive what kind of pipe you have to get your data out. The next thing is the actual router here, right? Things that we have to configure in order to be able to connect to an Azure Virtual Network is we need to be able to do port forwarding. We need to either have set up a static IP or use dynamic DNS. And I love the fact that I'm actually able to do routing tables at the router level. So all traffic can be controlled by the routing table that I set up. Third and finally here, I'm actually using a Mac mini. And, and the reason I love my Mac mini is because this thing is dead silent. Back in the day when I first started, I got a server from a friend, I turned it on, it made so much noise, I instantly shut it off. Um, this Mac mini, has six virtual CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM and two terabyte solid state hard drive. But the key thing to me is it works and it's dead silent. So I talk about cable modem being extremely important and why I said you wanna make sure that you have Doxis 3.1 at least. Here is why you're never gonna go faster than the limitations of your cable modem here. And so with 3.1 here, this allows you to get up to 10 gigabytes per second downstream and be able to get one or two gigabytes upstream. So when ISPs provide those kind of speeds, you would be able to get there. The key important thing to me though about 3.1 Doxis is the ability to have different channels configured for streaming data, whether it's up or down. I like to think of this in a way as like parallelism for a SQL Server query, right? If the day is busy and everyone needs to use their cable modem, well, if you have 32 channels that you can use to pull data down and your next door neighbor only has 16, that gives you 2x more downstream performance than your neighbor. So your downstream and upstream channels are very important. I include a link here to a lot more details about Doxis here. But the main thing to know if you're looking for a cable modem is make sure at least it's 3.1 and that hopefully you have 32 channels for downstream and eight channels for upstream at least. And here we're gonna go into some of those router configurations. The first one here is static routes. So I love the fact that in my router, I can do a static routing, which basically means if there's any traffic on my router that needs to go to 10.44 network, which is my Azure network, it will go through and it will forward and make that traffic go through 92.168.44.201, which is the IP address of my VM that's hosting my remote routing access service. So this way, it doesn't matter which VM in my local network all that traffic is gonna be routed through my remote access service here. The next thing I mentioned that I like to set up is changing the actual network subnet configuration. By default, with almost every router, you're gonna see 192.168.0. So I like to change that. So just if I ever need to connect that, and for whatever reason I need to connect to a friend's network, we're not using the exact same IP addresses so we can actually connect there. The last thing I'm gonna talk about here in regards to my router is port forwarding. So I just mentioned that we had the route table that would take any network traffic that needs to go to 10.44 and it would send it to the IP address of my remote routing access service. Well, that service runs on the following two UDP ports. This is port 500 and port 4500. So what this means is whenever Azure network comes into my static IP in my local network, it's gonna get routed over if it comes through these ports to go over to my remote routing access service. The following here now that we've talked about how the network gets over to our remote routing 
access service, this is showing you the configuration of the service. So the first thing you have to do is just like we have the routing set on our router, we're then gonna route that traffic here through our connection that we're gonna set up inside of remote access service here. So this is saying we created a network interface virtually called Azure GW. Any traffic that needs to go to 10.44 will go through that interface there. So the next thing is looking at how the interface is configured. And here when we go ahead and create this, you're actually going to give it that static IP address for the Azure Gateway. So keep in mind here, the very first thing you have to have for this to work is that static IP for the gateway in your Azure Virtual Network. All right, so once we plug that in, then we're able to go to the security configurations. And in this case here, we use a pre-shared key for authentication here. So the key ends up being used on both remote access services and also in your Azure Gateway. And then we just specify to use IP, TCP, IP6, and 4 here as well. In this video, we're going to show you now that we have network connectivity between both Azure and our home lab. We're going to show you how you can extend Active Directory and DNS by utilizing a VM and Azure and having it join the domain. So now we're gonna jump into our virtual machine here. And now it's not on the domain yet, so I'm gonna to have to go over here to more choices here. And I'm gonna give it the actual username and password for when I actually created this VM here so we can get into it. And there we can see we're actually able to get into it. So now we're in our VM here in Azure, directly connected and through our IPsec tunnel. So now we're actually going to go through and build the Active Directory here. So we're going to go over to Manage. We're going to add our roles and features. And I'm going to say Active Directory Domain Services here. And so it's going to go ahead and install everything for us in order to run uh, Active Directory Domain Controller here. And then once this install finishes, we'll actually go through on configuring it to sync with our existing Active Directory Domain Controller inside of our local domain. So now we're going to go through and we're actually going to promote our VM to be a domain controller here. So we want to add our domain controller to an existing domain so that way we can sync back and forth between any modifications in our Azure VNet for Active Directory and our local network as well. So this is going to be our past2020.com here. I'm going to select that. Past 2020. So the credentials I'm giving here is actually credentials that will allow me to join the domain there. So here we actually have to log in with an account on the domain already existing in order to add this domain controller to the existing domain. So here on our next screen, we're actually going to go through and configure our password here in case we ever need to go through directory services or store mode and set up that we actually want DNS on this box as well. This is going to tell us that we're not going to be delegating 
So we're going to replicate from any domain controller. So if we wanted to, we could specify exactly which one. In our case, we only have one in our local network. And for our presentation here, we're only going to have one in our virtual network. Now, we can use both of these as a fail-safe for each other. So this goes through the pre-checks and gives you any type of warnings that come out here. So in here you can see we actually have Active Directory now configured in our Azure VNet here. So now we can communicate back and forth with our domain controller and our local network. All right, now that we have our Active Directory configured in our Azure VM, the next thing we're going to do is utilize another VM to create our Windows failover cluster. In this demo, we're going to go over verifying our servers and make sure that they are compatible with building a Windows failover cluster. Then we're going to go ahead and build that Windows failover cluster across both our local domain and also our virtual network out in Azure. So we're going to start by loading our failover cluster manager tool. We've already gone through and installed failover clustering on all three servers here. So we're going to go to validate configuration here to see if our servers are able to pass all the verification rules to make sure that we have a good cluster. So we're going to add our local two servers, LSQL01 and LSQL02. And then of course I have another VM that I create out, at, out in Azure that we call ASQL01 here. So we're going to add that as well. So now you can see that we've selected all three of our servers here. We have our two local network servers. Their names start with L, it's an LSQL01 and LSQL02. We've also added now our Azure server out in our virtual network out in Azure as ASQL01. So let's go ahead and validate them. Because this is a Windows failover cluster being built for availability groups, we don't want to run all of the tests because we're not really interested in storage as so we're going to use our local storage here. So here you're going to see I'm going to uncheck storage here. So now we're going to use the cluster wizard validation tool to go ahead and validate and make sure that we're able to build a functional Windows failover cluster. All right, so we finished validating the cluster here, and we can see that even though we have some warnings, we are still have a configuration that could be used to build our Windows failover cluster. So before we get started creating the cluster, let's go ahead and look at the report to see what warnings came up. All right, so let's go ahead and dive deeper into these network warnings that we have. The first one's going to be to validate the IP configuration. And so as we scroll through here, we're going to see that our warning here mentions that the DNS suffix search list does not match. And this is going to make sense once we go look at it. So on our Azure server here, we're going to see that our primary first DNS is our domain past 2020. There's also an internal DNS suffix here as well for Azure as this is Azure server up in the cloud here. Now, our local servers here, you're gonna see that we only have one DNS suffix and that's our domain pass 2020. So this is good here. So let's go back and check 
our other warning. Under network here, if we go to validate network communication, this is going to state that we have a single point of failure in our network. And this is because we're doing this as migrating our hybrid lab, lab is in not production, we only have one network configured. So this is just stating that, hey, there's only one single path from a NIC card reaching to the other NIC card. And it's a single point of failure if communication between those goes down, well, that's gonna end communication between those servers. So let's go back. And then we saw we had system configuration here and validate software. So this is just telling us that we have some updates that have been applied to one server that are on the other servers here. So these are things, again, production, you'd want to make sure these were all identical as well. All right, let's go ahead and close this down. And now we're going to click this checkbox here that's going to allow us to actually create the cluster with the validated nodes that we just validated. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have to specify two things in order to build the Windows failover cluster. One of them is going to be the name that's going to create a computer object for. And the second one is going to be the IP addresses that we're going to end up using. So. And so this one's going to be 204. We're going to definitely uncheck add all eligible storage here as we don't have any storage that we want to add. And we're going to begin to create our failover cluster. All right, so here we can see that we were able to successfully complete our cluster creation here. We have all three nodes here, our two local nodes here, our servers, uh, local SQL 01, local SQL 02, and also our Azure VM, a SQL 01, is a node in our Windows cluster as well. Let's go ahead and double check here, and we'll view our report here. This shows that we were able to check the computer objects here and make sure that they existed. That we we're actually able to bind the domain controller over here for Azure VM and the Azure VNet. All right, key thing to point here. We have not gone through Quorum yet. Um, here, so that's noted here at the very bottom, but we do have a successful cluster that we can finish and use. So we're going to click finish. And there we go. We can see our Windows Server cluster service 01 on our domain here. And we can see that we have this configured here with all three of our servers here. done.
three, two, one. All right, we can see here in our Windows failover cluster, we have all three nodes, you know, virtual servers here, two in our local data center here, our Azure VM as well from our VNet. And under networks here, we're gonna see two networks here. We have our one network with our 92.168.44 subnet here for our two local servers. And then we also have our second network here, which is our 10.44.0 subnet over in our Azure VNet as well. All right, now that we have our Windows failover cluster created, now we're going to go through the process of completing all the parts together with SQL Server, which we love, by building an availability group between both the local network and the Azure Virtual Network. Before we get started, I want to focus again on the core network parts here that you should have prepared. Now, in our case, we're going to have a three replica, so three virtual machines, two locally, one in Azure, and then, of course, we're going to need a computer named object for our Windows failover cluster and also our, our availability group listener. So in this case here for the listener in the Windows failover cluster, this needs to span both our local network and our Azure virtual network. So you're going to see that we're going to have IP addresses that we're going to need for both networks there. And then again, just before we start, this is our end goal here of we're going to have two replicas locally in our local network here called L sql 01 and L sql 2 We're going to have an AG called AG01 and then an AG listener that will allow applications to connect regardless of which network or which data center is hosting our actual primary replica. Let's go ahead and build out that availability group. Now we get to have fun and finally build our availability group. Now, the first thing I want you to know that in order for you to fail over to an Azure VM, if you use the SQL Server templates inside of Azure, you have to make sure that you set up some security property for the system account here. So you'll find that the availability group will fail to fail over if the system account is not able to view server state or alter any availability group. So we're gonna connect over here first to our Azure SQL Server VM and we're going to make sure that we grant these privileges. So that way, when we build our availability group, we're able to fail it over correctly. Now that we have that established here, we have this database that I've already set up called AG Test on our local SQL 01 VM here. We're going to use this database to build out our availability group. So in order to do that here, we're going to go over to Always On Availability Groups, and we're going to go ahead and do the next availability group wizard here. So we're going to go ahead and give it a name called AG01. This is going to be a Windows Server Failover Cluster, as we've already configured not only SQL Server to work with the Windows Failover Cluster, but also we've built the Windows Failover Cluster. We can see that our database has met the prerequisites to be part of an availability group, so we're going to select it. And then here's where we're going to add our two other replicas. First, we're going to go ahead and add our other local replica here. And then we're going to go ahead and add our Azure one as well. So we're going to do primary automatic failover locally. And then we're going to go ahead and configure. I'm going to go ahead and choose synchronous. Typically in the real world, if you're going to go to another data center, you probably would use asynchronous here. But 
For our presentation, I'm just going to keep everything synchronous, but require a manual failover. And I'm going to allow us to actually read as well over in our replica here, out in Azure. Now for our endpoints here, this is important. We're going to use our default 5022. This means you'd have to have firewall exceptions here to allow network connectivity through port 5022 on each one of these servers. We're not going to go ahead and change anything with backup preferences. And also, we're not going to create the listener until I have a successful availability group. I always like to set this up second. And then for today, we're not even going to bother with read routing as well. So the next thing we're going to set up here is because this is an empty database that we're using, I'm going to go ahead and do automatic seeding. If this was a much bigger database, maybe we would want to use something like log shipping to pre-sync the data, and then we would just join it here once we're ready. But since we have an empty database here, we're just going to go ahead and do automatic seeding. So this is going to go through all the pre-checks there, and we don't have the listener set up, so we don't even have to worry about the configuration there. But the warning will tell you that it's just not configured. So one thing I like to always do is script this out. Even if when I click finish, I like to script it out so at least that way I have the scripts of exactly what was done for documentation purposes. So we'll go ahead and script all that out so that we have it. And we'll go ahead here and click finish. And what we should see here is this will go through all the steps of making sure the endpoints are connected and work and have the right access. This will go ahead and turn on the always on health extended event for monitoring and troubleshooting. And then this will actually create and join the replicas over to the primary replica. And so there we can see that we've actually finished with creating our availability group. So let's go check it out. So I'm going to go ahead and refresh over here and we're going to see that we have our primary replica and our secondary replicas, we are connected. We have our AG test database connected here. And we don't have an availability group listener set up yet. So let's go ahead and just do a quick test to make sure that we got data syncing across, that we would be able to see this. Remember when I created the availability group, the A SQL 01 replica here was able to read. So if I was to go over to my little demo here, so I'm gonna go over here and make sure we connect to our primary replica, which would be our local SQL 01. And I wanna to connect to my AG test database here. So again, if we go here and we refresh, we'll see that that's there. Connected here, local SQL 01. So we're able to create our table here. And then also, I'm going to go ahead and insert a thousand records here. And while it's doing that here, I'm just going to go ahead and grab, set up a new query connected over to Azure A SQL 01. And we're going to connect to our AG test here. And we can see that we can read the data that's came over. So as the data is being inserted here, we can see that it's coming over. All right. So we have good data flow here. Let's go ahead and actually go ahead now and implement our listener. Now, your listener is actually what we would typically use from an application to connect. So this way it can connect to the same computer named object that will not change, 
Regardless of whether our primary replica is in our local data center or out in our Azure virtual network. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to create that now. So here we're going to create our DNS name, which I'm just going to call AGL01. We're going to say we want to connect through 1433. And we're going to give it static IP addresses. So the first one I'm going to do is over in our VNet over here, I'm going to say 10.44.0.100. And then I'm going to go ahead and add our local network here, 192.168.44.205. And again, I like to script this out just so I have this for reference as well. And then we'll hit OK. And this will go through the process of actually going into Active Directory and DNS and creating our objects so we have our listener. Great, so we have that. We can now connect to our listener. So our query here, I'm just gonna go ahead and change this to AGL01. Oh, let's we'll switch over to our database here. And there we go. We can see that we finished our insert of the thousand rows here. We're able to connect through our listener here. So now that we have our connectivity over here, let's go ahead and fail over now to our replica over in our Azure virtual network. So I'm going to right click over here. I'm going to click fail over. Because we did do synchronous here, we're able to fail without any data loss, even though this will be a manual failover, which is planned. I'm gonna connect over here. All right, and we're gonna go ahead and fail over. Remember, I wanna mention this one more time. If that VM in Azure, the system account, doesn't have access to view server state or modify the availability group, this failover will fail. Since we've already done it at the very beginning of this video, we should be okay and have a successful failover. So we can go there. At the same time, we can look at our replica here. We can see that it came online. It even came online with our new IP address that we added with the listener. And here you can see we've had our successful failover. So once again, now we're primary out in Azure on our Azure VM. If I come back over here now, I'm going to refresh our connection over to Azure SQL 01. We can see it's now primary. And now we can connect from our listener, even on our local network, connect back out to our primary replica through the listener. So we're gonna go ahead and change this again. We're gonna go ahead and do our new connection. All right, so now we're gonna reconnect to the listener. Now I'm on listener, I'm on local zero one. We're gonna actually connect here through the listener that's gonna take us over to our Azure replica. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and actually select our AG test. And then same thing here, if I just do select server name, 
You can see we've connected and we have established connectivity from both ends and are able to use our AG listener. All right. Well, now that we have our availability group, I'd like to thank you for joining me and sticking with us in this session. I look forward to your feedback. Please, I ask once again, please go ahead and fill out the speaker evaluation and let me know what I could do to help you build out your hybrid lab. Once again, this is John Sterrett. Thank you.